Praise the Lord, everybody. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. <sighs> good evening, everybody. Amen. God is still good. Amen. He's still on the throne, ruling and reigning. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, first of all, first giving out to God, to uh, who is ahead of my life, uh, to my pastor, Dr. Pointer, First Lady, Sister Pointer, uh, Minister Presley, who made it a little difficult for me for today. Amen. Uh, the Lord used her yesterday, and I told her in the back, amen. I told her in the back, I wish I was, I was jealous of her when she was done. Because now I knew it was my turn. I wish we could have switched. Amen. But um, <laughs> but I'll be good about 9 o'clock. Amen. Um, to my wife, beautiful prayer, honey. Love you. All right. Aw. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's do what we came to do. Amen. Hopefully to hear a word from the Lord. I ask that you would meet me at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. When you get there, say amen. If you need a minute, say wait a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. And it reads, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Uh, I like to talk Run the thought, the subject, the theme for a few moments. Uh, if I could title this, it would be called, There's a Blessing at Your Breaking Point. There's a Blessing at Your Breaking Point. Life is filled with periods of both trouble and triumph. There are times when we're on the mountaintop, and there are other times in which we are in the valley. And if we are going to be honest, it feels as if the valleys seem to come more frequently than the mountaintop. And they seem to last longer than the mountaintop experiences. And there are times in the valley in which we reach our breaking point. Each of us have had moments where we've been tested beyond our comfort zone. And a breaking point is a place where your emotional, mental, and sometimes physical anguish and adversity meet. Though you can't directly put your finger on your breaking point, you know when you are there or coming very close to it. Uh, this is a place where we make statements like, I can't take it anymore. Maybe it's just me. I, I've been at places where I said, I can't take it anymore. Uh, made statements like, if anybody else says another word to me, I'm going to, you fill in the blank. This is a place where some may even have contemplated and taken their very own life rather than continue to keep on living. And if you haven't come to a point in your life where you reach that breaking point, you keep on living because eventually you're going to get close to it or even get there. And it is at this point of extreme intensity and pain God wants to bless you. Most of us would think the idea of the buffeting or the problem and the blessing are totally opposite or foreign to one another. 
And it's difficult for us to wrap our finite minds around the biblical concept that before the blessing comes the buffering. And that the buffering indeed produces the blessing. The, the Apostle Paul saw a definite connection between buffeting and being blessed. He realized that the Lord was purposeful in all he did and in all he permitted to come into his life, whether good or bad. Paul realized that though he could not live a problem-free life, it was better to look beyond them and understand that God was doing something through these problems, that God was building growth. He was making him more effective, and he was raising him up to be more mature, and that evidently this would all produce in him. But it had to take the buffering before he could get to the blessing. And it's easy to learn or to read the scripture, James 1, which says, count it all joy when you go through various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It's easy to read that. But when you're going through, it's hard to make that apply into your life. It's hard to see God's handiwork in the midst of all the hell that you may be going through. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul explains what God had taught him when it seemed that life was giving him a good beating. And he was at his breaking point. And there are some very important principles that, I, that he learned that I think we can apply right to our lives. And the first thing that we see right here was he had to experience it, the buffeting. The buffeting. And that word buffet means it applies pain. In that it means to strike with clenched hands. He understood that this buffeting, this pain that he had experienced, is no one that had a purpose. There was a purpose behind it. It says in verse 7a, it says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, though the abundance of, of revelation. This buffering that God allowed in his life was to keep him humble, was to remove pride from him. God allows buffeting in our lives to keep us from thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think of. That was the case for Paul. Sometimes God does it for us to keep us humble, but he also might allow us to be buffeted to, to have us change our tongue because maybe some of us cuss too much. I'm talking about believers. Maybe we got a foul mouth in. God got a lot of buffeting to come to correct your mouth. Maybe he does it to change your behavior. But he's doing it for a purpose and a plan. And in Paul's case, it was to reduce his pride. And if anyone had a reason to be prideful, it was Paul. Earlier in the scriptures, uh, uh, 12 years ago before when he written, wrote this, uh, he was given an opportunity to see the third heaven. Now, we understand there's three heavens. There's this heaven, what we see. There's space. And then the third heaven where God resides. Paul was given a glimpse the opportunity to see what heaven looks like. And so for him to not be prideful, God had to buffet. He, he used the messenger of Satan, and I'll get into that, to buffet him, to keep him humble. A lot of us, if we truth be told, we get prideful if we just read a little scripture. We teach Bible study or, or, or teach a war class or do something to help pastor out, and all of a sudden we think we should be at the pulpit. And God has to send adversity and trouble in your life to keep you humble. But he did that for a reason, to reduce his pride. Not only was there a purpose, but there was, look at the properties that it was involved in it. Number one, it was painful. And that word thorn means a sharp stake used for torturing or impaling someone. When he said a thorn in the flesh, to be honest, I thought he was talking about like a thorn, like a rose thorn. But the word buffet, I mean, thorn means a sharp stake that was used to torture him. Every time his pride wanted to raise up, he got buffeted, he got hit, he got th a thorn in his side to keep him humble. But he kept on pushing. He kept on preaching. He kept on doing what God called him to do in spite of the pain. Why would God allow this to happen? It was for his purpose and his plan. Not only was it painful, but secondly, it was physical. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7b, it says it was in the flesh. And some uh, commentaries say that 
they, they, they don't know what exactly the thorn was. It could have been uh, he was having eye trouble. Some say insomnia, migraine headaches, malaria. But whatever it was, he was suffering something physically. And there are some of us that are experiencing some physical ailments right now. Underneath the skin, you look good, but underneath the skin, somebody's in here and is in some pain. Some physical pain, not only mental and emotional, but maybe somebody's here in some physical pain. And underneath the smile, you, you're in quiet desperation, but God is doing that for a reason. Not only did we see the purpose, and not only did we see that it was physical, but we also see its producer. It says it was a messenger of Satan. And the word messenger is the Greek word angelos, which is the same word often used as angel. It was an angel of Satan who was the delivery person in his bodily affliction for Paul. And though Satan cannot touch God's children at his will, God may sometimes use Satan and his messengers to accomplish his divine purposes. I don't know why God uses sometimes opposition. He uses sometimes people hating on you to, to, for ultimate to fulfill his plan and purpose in our lives. We may not like it. We may not agree with it. But we got to understand, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. But there's a purpose behind it. There's a, it's physical, and it's also we see its producer. But that's the buffeting part. But not only the buffeting, we also see there was a burden. The burden was that Paul asked three times for God to remove it, and God didn't do it. There are some prayers that God is going to remove out of our way, but there's others that God is going to not answer your prayer. And my question is, will you still serve God if he doesn't answer your prayer? Will you still be faithful? Will you still keep coming? Will you still keep pursuing God if he says no to your answer? You've been praying, God, save my husband, save my wife, save my kids. Happens if he does not say it, if he does not answer it. Will you still be faithful? We live in an age where people only want self-gratification and only come to God to get something. And they come to church, and if they don't hear what they want, they automatically shut it off. Some of us can be like that, preach me up, and sometimes it's just like medicine. It may not taste good, but it's good for you. It's necessary, to, and it's doing something in us. God didn't answer. He didn't take it away. He just said, my grace. And this is a burden that God doesn't remove. Why, I don't know, but we got to be content in whatever state that we're in. And there, he had no doubt. He felt the problem, but he knew that God was keeping him and accomplishing something greater than he could even imagine. And when we're going through, we only sometimes, when we're going through, we only see it nearsighted. We don't see the bigger picture. And a lot of times, if we realize, if we just said, Lord, have your way, then we'll understand down the line, Lord, this is why I had to go through this hell. Because now I can go tell somebody else of how God delivers. I had to go through this drug addiction. I had to go through this alcoholism. I had to go through this financial difficulty. So when I get brought out I can go back and reach and help somebody else because so often when God delivers us if we're not careful we can act like he hasn't done nothing and keep moving but God will bless you more when you appreciate all that he's done and thank him for the good times and the bad we got to praise him even when, when the Lord giveth and when he takes away it's good to worship God when he gives who wouldn't want to serve a God that gives you life and he gives you, blesses you each and every day? But what will you say when he takes away your loved one, takes away your finances, takes away things that you thought you were comfortable and had locked in? When he takes it away, will you still praise him? If you don't hear nothing else today, will you still praise him and give him glory if he don't bless you no more? He had a burden. And oftentimes when we have burdens, we lash out. I'll say me. When I have a burden, I lash out. I fuss at my family. I, I kick the dog, which I don't have a dog, but I, I just go all off. 
<laughs> but I lash out because I'm not handling the burden properly. But I got to take it and change it. Why is God allowing this situation? And sometimes the burdens could be because I brought it on myself. If we're going to be honest, we can't always say the devil did this, the devil did that. No, you did that. you the one that makes $100 a week and you bought a $5,000 a month house. That's your fault. That's your fault. Not, don't blame that on the devil. That was your foolishness. We sometimes are our worst enemies and our worst crew. We're the reason why <laughs> that we do it. But not only are we sometimes the reason, but uh, secondly, we're, God might be once again teaching us something. God wants to take us out of the, uh, the victim mentality and turn us into the student. There's a difference between a victim and a student. The victim is, has the woe is me mentality. Say, Lord, what is going on? Why is this happening? All, all this complaining. I can't take all this stuff. But a student is saying, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Master, what are you trying to show me? What areas of improvement do I need to focus on? One of the things that I uh, talk to my, my clients in, in, in relapse prevention, and one of it because to be honest, we all need to be delivered from some things, amen? And it's not just drugs and alcohol. And one of the questions that I pose is, your new way of living, or your abstinence right now, are you moving away from your addiction, or are you moving towards a new lifestyle? There's a difference. Are you moving away from your addiction, or are you moving towards a new lifestyle? The difference is, Moving away from my addiction means I'm only doing this temporarily. I really don't want to do this. I really, I don't feel like doing this, but I'm only doing it to make you happy. God, I'm only coming to church because that makes you happy. My motivation ain't pure. I'm only coming because if I don't come to church, what are they going to say about me? I'm only doing it to shut your mouth. But when I'm moving towards a new lifestyle, I then start changing my mind. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I start changing. My mind starts changing. I start seeing things like God sees it. And I don't worship him because I have to. I worship him because I love him that much. The song we sang, Lord, I love you more than anything. Lord, I love you. It took, a, it took time to get to that point. Lord, I love you even when I don't feel like coming. Look, let's be honest. It's raining outside. It's Thursday night. We could be chilling right now. But, Lord, I love you more than anything. What are you moving towards? What new lifestyle are you moving towards? That means you got to cut off old people, old places, and some old things. Some of us, we, 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 oh, I'm new now, I'm clean, I'm doing the right thing, but still go around the same people and wonder why you keep going off on detour. You got to cut some people off. And let's be honest, it's hard cutting people off. Particularly, they could be even in your family, you got to cut off. See, you can pick your friends, but you're born in the family. I can't pick who my parents and my cousins are. But you got to sometimes make some tough decisions and understand and trust that God is doing it for his good and our, our good and his glory. But not only do we have to cut off some people, we got to cut off some places. It amazes me how so many Christians keep doing the same stuff as the world does. Keep doing the same things and wondering why, once again, we keep going. We got to cut that off. Not only the people, the places, but the things. We got to stop doing the same things. But we're sometimes the reason for the burden, but also God could be allowing the burden to teach us something. So not only did I say, number one, there's the buffeting. Number two, not only did I say there's the burden. But number three, there's the blessing. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And that word grace is the Greek word uh, 
Charisit, C-H-A-R-I-S-I-T, and it's used 150 times in the scripture. And it should be used frequently because we live in grace. It is grace below us. It is grace above us, before us, and behind us. It is grace in which we stand. And this word refers to God's divine favor, his divine blessings, his divine benefits. I don't know about you, but it's a blessing being a Christian. If you think it's hard now, imagine you not having Christ in your life. You will truly see how hard it really is. But there's a blessing being a Christian because we have somebody that we can call on at any time of the day. Any min in the midnight hour, we can call on Jesus, and he's never busy. And this word grace refers to, once again, divine favor, blessing, and benefit, and refers to that which God has given us in Christ, not because we earned or deserved it, but because he willed to give it. I don't know about you, but we don't deserve God's grace. Maybe you do. I don't deserve his grace. When I look in the mirror, I see flaws. I see fractures, I see messed up thinking, I see things that are nasty and ugly. But in spite of that, God still gives us his grace. He still gives us his mercy. And it not only says, it says his grace is sufficient. Sufficient grace means enough grace. God supplies us with as much grace as we need in every situation that we face. Whatever situation you in, God is going to give you enough grace to be able to handle whatever you in. Even if it looks like if God took away a loved one, guess what? God's going to give you enough grace to be able to handle the situation that doesn't seem bearable. And guess what? God can't lie. If he said it, it's he's going to do it. Grace is for, he gives us grace for facing illness. He gives us grace for dealing with our finances. Somebody's in a financial dilemma right now, and God is going to give you enough grace to be able to make it. Not only grace for finances, but he's going to give you grace for your lack of wisdom. If you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you liberally. Because guess what? You can have all the money in the world and be dumb. I need God to give me some wisdom so when he blesses me with more finances, I know how to handle it properly. You keep the money and be dumb. I'll be, look, have wisdom and manage whatever God's given me. He gives you grace for the lack of social skills, being able to communicate with each other. And God gives you grace for, for parents for dealing with rebellious children. <laughs> There's some children, look, if we be honest, there's sometimes we see them like, God, I need you right now. I'm going to take them out of here. God gives you strength. <laughs> he gives you grace to be able to deal with rebellious children. <laughs> God gives you grace to be able to deal with your boss at work that you can't stand. <laughs> I had a situation this week, and I didn't know why God gave me this sermon, but I had to experience something. What's today? Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday. Heard my boss. It was something that misunderstanding something, and I heard her on the speaker say, uh, "She said something out of my manhood. Called me out of my manhood." And I heard it on the speakerphone talking to another coworker, and I needed God right then because I was about to lose everything. And it be it was so happened that right when I heard it, and I said, "Oh, wait till she come in here." She comes around the corner, and I had to go walk away before I go off. I had to pray. I called my wife, called pastor. I said, look, I got to. And we had a meeting, a, a, a staff meeting, and it got heated in the meeting. Not even on the, what she said. I'm off, angry off something else. But God gave me wisdom, and I thank God for that. I asked, Lord, help me. And I did not address the situation that day. Thank God. I would, not, I would be unemployed right now and say pray for me and my family because I'm looking for another job. And not wise at all. <laughs> so yesterday, she called me in because we were going over some dates that I'm taking off of work. And we were talking, and I said, you know what? I got a problem with you. 
I said, I'm mad at you. And she said, for what? And I told her why. And she said, you know what? I'm sorry. I apologize. Yada, yada, yada. Oh, you know, okay. Kept it moving because I, I talk, okay, but I got to still remove myself. Met with her today, and now look how God works. She's, we met, and she says, what are your goals? Because I see you bigger than this. She says this, and what I want to start doing is implementing more spiritual things in this recovery uh, program. I work for Drexel University. She says, I want to implement this, and I want you to spearhead it and come up with a curriculum, and we're going to do stuff for ways for you to make income off of this. Because I handled it properly. Because I didn't blow my cool. Because I didn't blow my top. God indeed blessed me. And I wanted to tell somebody here, he did that to let somebody know that when you reach your breaking point, don't give in to your flesh. Don't go cuss nobody out. You got to stand where God told you to stand. And he will fight your battle for you. And he will bless you beyond what your mind can imagine. Eyes have not seen, ear have not heard, nor entered to the heart the things that God has in store for us. He learned that, Paul, Paul learned that God was sufficient even in his insufficiency. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. And it's not because of me, it's because of the God I serve. The God we serve. Not only do we see God's grace, but we saw his power. And it took dunamis power. That's the power. It's talking about dynamite power to do something like that. God is so awesome that that's why we got to keep on moving and not going off of how we feel and throwing in the towel because God called us. He's going to lead us to where we need to go. And he's going to give us power to be able to endure whatever situation that we're in. And I don't know about you, but we need power in everything that we do. When we come in contact with people at work, we need power. I'm not talking about our own strength, but I'm talking about dunamis power that can make us strong when we're weak, that can keep us focused when we want to go off left, that can keep us when we want to punch somebody in the face. He keeps our arms stayed straight and our minds stayed on him. Only a God that has all power in his hand can do that. He gives us power, and not only that, but he says so he can rest. And that word rest means to wrap over him like a tent. You can rest in it knowing that God is going to give you all the grace and the power and everything that you need. I've never been camping, but when I go in a tent, when you go in a tent, the whole tent encompasses you. And that's what God says. When you're weak, guess what? His grace is so much. It goes all around you and keeps you from coming apart not only did we see his um not only do you see his provision for his grace and his power but we end on we see that paul took pleasure <laughs> he was content verse 10 says therefore i take pleasure in infirmities hold on wait a minute i was complaining lord take this away from me but now i'm saying lord I take now pleasure in going through, in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says, now I see clearly, now I take pleasure in this adversity. And that word pleasure, take pleasure, basically means to be well pleased with. He said, come hell or high water, Lord, I'm content in whatever you're doing in my life. Paul learned to move from the agony to the ecstasy. He started off in the buffeting and the pain and, the, Lord, take this away. But now he is transitioned into ecstasy, into pleasure. And only a God like that can turn his mind in just three verses. In seven, I said he was complaining. Lord, take this away. And now in verse 10, he's changed his mind. Only an awesome God like that can change his mind just like that. He learned to be content when he had money and when he didn't have it. When he was weak, he still said, Lord, you get all the glory. 
And I'm certain that he who began a good work in you will accomplish it to the day of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God ain't finished, ain't through with me yet. You should be glad, too. He ain't through with us yet. If that was the case, then we'd be dead right now. But the fact that we're still here breathing, he has a purpose and a plan for us, and he wants to do something in us. And that's why Paul can say in Romans 8, 28, and we know. There's some things that you got to know. I don't need somebody else to tell. I know this for myself, that God works, causes all things. Not some things, but all things to work together for the good. To them that call by God and those that are called according to his purpose. I'm so glad. Can you say so glad? I'm so glad that weeping may endure for a night, but joy will indeed come in the morning. I'm so glad that when I reach my breaking point, when I reach my boiling point, the point when I'm about to lose it, I can say, Lord, here comes my blessing. Lord, here you come. Show me. Blow my mind. Lord God, didn't I blow your mind this time? Didn't I? He's worthy to be praised. So next time when you're at your breaking point, you need to assume position. I don't say this position, but you need to get down. You need to get on your knees and say, Lord, not my will. Nevertheless, Lord, if you could take this away from me, but nevertheless, not my will. But thy will be done. He's worthy to be praised. And all God wants you to do is praise him in advance. Even when you don't see it, give him praise. Give him honor and give him glory. He's worthy to be praised. What a word. There's a blessing at your breaking point. I needed to hear that. You didn't, I did. We all did. The buffeting is purpose. Painful. It is painful when you're going through. Can I get a witness? Yeah. But there's a purpose for your pain in mind. And it's a physical thing sometimes. And then I've got angry with God for why you let the enemy do, beat up on me. But God lets us to know that whatever it is we're going through, his grace is sufficient. And I know, if the truth be told, there are times that's the last thing I want to hear about, grace sufficient. But God lets us to know it's beyond just you. It's about him. Because when we are weak, when everybody else know it had to be other than us, then we see who God is. And we serve an awesome God, don't we? Give God some praise as we rest on our feet. As we rest on our feet. Thank you for such a word for tonight. Revival. It's an encouraging word. It's a convicting word. It's a powerful word. And we know that God is still on the scene. Having said that, we never assume that everybody under the sound of our voice has a relationship with the God of heaven. And the way to have a relationship with the God of heaven is to have a relationship with God the Son, Jesus. Somebody in here, I don't know what they told you, but... We all going to die sooner or later. And wouldn't it be a tragedy to suffer hellishness, a hell-like life here while you're living, and then die and go to hell? Why would a God do that? No, he doesn't do that. We dismiss Jesus, our Savior, and we make decisions and choices that have eternal consequences. But here tonight, the Bible still clear. It says, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, separation. But the gift of God is eternal life 